If you've not yet played Early Access, then you'll be in for a shock, because there's a certain peddler of potions and lotions in the Druid Grove who looks deceptively kind and gentle, yet hides a dark secret, namely that she's actually a green hag, one of the foulest and most wicked of evil fey creatures. Upon visiting her in her home in the so-called sunlit wetlands, in reality a fetid swamp, you may discover that she is more than what she pretends to be, and not simply a harmless old woman hawking her wares. The scenario is thus, Auntie Ethel is holding a girl, Mirina, semi-captive. I say semi because the girl has in fact volunteered to provide Auntie Ethel with her baby upon carrying it to term, in exchange for Ethel's promise to bring her dead husband back to life. A fool's errand, of course, but nonetheless, one which the hopeful Marina has fallen for. However, it is never explicitly mentioned or explained what Auntie Ethel wants with Marina's baby and why she actively encourages her to eat as much as she does. And it is the purpose of this video to explore this and other matters hag-related. There are several races or sub-races of hag, and they all differ in several important ways but one thing is consistently observable about all of them. They are uniquely and uniformly female, with no exception, and they are all profoundly evil and selfish. How then, one might ask, do they reproduce? How do new hags come into the world? This is where Marina comes into play. Since hags are most secretive, no one truly knows how hags reproduce, but over the millennia, many myths and stories have emerged, some of which seem far more plausible than others. The first plausible theory of hag reproduction is the requirement that they find a male, usually a human or demi-human, and most commonly a human or half-elf, and by various means, kidnapping, coercion, or more frequently through deception, vis-a-vis -vis charm or illusion magic, to force said male to copulate with the hag. The male will thereafter be slain, and the hag will then lie dormant in a state of pregnancy for nine months after which she will give birth to a female child, and the female child will initially appear as a member of the race of the father, and this daughter is then raised in the father's society. Hags will almost never raise their own daughters, as they have next to zero maternal instincts. Despite appearing either human or demi-human, such hag daughters often have subtle personality traits, and sometimes even physical traits that indicate that they are not what they seem to be, depending on the subspecies of hag ranging from being powerfully built, to displays of aggression, to toxic personalities, and other minor hints. Such women will appear largely normal until they have reached their mid-40s and will then irrevocably change into a hag of the sword of their mother. The other, much more likely theory in the case of Baldur's Gate 3, and the one that Larian seems to have chosen, that seems to directly relate to Mirina, is a far more direct method, which involves the hag devouring a human infant However, to get there, the woman must first give birth, hence Auntie Ethel's encouragement of Marina to eat up and to eat for two. This is no coincidence, although it is impossible to know the exact details. The health of the baby to be devoured is probably paramount in order to effectively reproduce as a hag, which is why Ethel is so adamant about it. Marina, of course, probably has no clue about the ultimate fate of her baby, and probably does not care since she bought into the hag's deal in the first place, on the promise that her husband might be brought back from the dead, something that was obviously not going to happen, given the nature of hags. If the deal were to go through and Ethel were to keep the baby, either because you failed to stop her or you let her go with the baby, then the following would likely happen. After the hag consumes the infant, she will become pregnant, give birth to a seemingly normal child, and rarely, if ever, raise the child on her own, as they have no maternal instincts to speak of, as mentioned prior, whereupon the child is dropped off into some human settlement to grow whilst the hag watches from afar, with glee at how her daughter brings ruin to human civilization. In the case of a hag spawned by this method, the change to proper hag occurs after only 13 years. In very rare cases, a hag may personally raise her daughter so as to form or add to a coven, a topic we will come back to later, but inasmuch as this theory of reproduction is true, it almost certainly seems to be the reason for having made the deal with Marina. But this is but one deal, as hags love to trick, deceive, and barter, and making deals with foolish humans and demi-humans is probably the hag's favorite pastime. In this sense, hags have something in common with devil kind, 
as they always seek to twist the terms of the deals they make. But unlike devil kind, which, being supremely lawful, is at least bound to the letter of the law, has care nothing for such legalese, and will make or break a deal on a whim, if and when it suits them. You can talk to such individuals who have brokered so-called deals with Auntie Ethel in the tea house. After you have slain her, Lauren, for example, is a wood elf who asked the hag for help in seeing the future, for which she provided a vision of the future, one in which he is perpetually trapped, forced to live in an alternate reality where the future is already happening. Another victim is a petrified dwarf, who was told that he had to be petrified in order to prevent a wasting illness that ruins you from the inside out, only to find out that it was the hag all along who had inflicted the illness upon him in the first place. Finally, you meet a halfling whose mother was suffering from an ailing mind, to which she sought a solution, which Auntie Ethel conveniently claimed to provide, where after she ended up in the hag's clutches. Logical, you might think. Hag simply cannot be trusted, and Auntie Ethel is no exception to this rule. But good old Auntie Ethel also has other secrets. If you defeat her, then her laboratory is open to you to explore, and you will discover a letter to someone Ethel refers to as her sister. This is interesting because there is a direct reference to the halfling that sought Ethel's help for her ailing mother. Ethel writes, and I quote, A mother with a failing mind. You know me so well. I have the most darling mask for her. The letter then gets cut off, with Auntie Ethel attempting to invite her sister to visit her. This same halfling I mentioned prior, when talking to her, tells you that her business with the hags is not yet finished, and that she is returning to the city of Baldur's Gate. So let's now talk about hag covens. They are actually a thing, and it is entirely possible that Ethel is part of one. Under normal circumstances, hags overwhelmingly prefer to work and live alone, but there are times when alliances are useful and offer more possibilities than solitary existence does. Whilst an individual hag can control a local area and bend its inhabitants to her will, a coven of hags can rule over entire nations, either directly or indirectly, in part because working in unison, their already formidable magical abilities become further enhanced, sometimes gaining vast powers that allow them to control nature the weather, oceans, cause plagues, or wield power over life or death. A coven usually consists of three hags, though greater numbers are possible, which means that if Ethel's so-called sister is in Baldur's Gate and they form a coven, then there's probably a third hag involved somewhere that we might encounter later. Another hint of Ethel's involvement in a coven, or with her quote-unquote sister, is in her arrogant response when you defeat her and let her off the hook as she makes a promise of revenge towards you, as well as states that she will be setting up shop elsewhere. Either way, it does not seem as if this will be the final encounter we have with Auntie Ethel, or hags in general. As assuming we kill her, I have little doubt that her hag sister will almost certainly want to exact revenge upon us for doing so, and if we let her go, we will likely get double the trouble once we finally arrive in Baldur's Gate proper. Of course, from a power gaming perspective, the prospect of a free plus one to any ability stat seems too good to pass up on, which is probably the route I would take most of the time, with the hope that we might be able to kill Ethel and her sister later, unless of course I'm playing a goody two-shoes. But what do you think about Auntie Ethel, and what do you think her plans are? Do you prefer to spare her for the bonus to ability scores, or kill her? I'm definitely curious about her fate, and her interactions with the player characters come full release which might end up being far more complex than Early Access lets on. As always, thank you for tuning in. Please leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe, as it really helps out the channel. And I will check you out next time. Take care.